I'm proud and privileged to present to you Fatima Manji as chair of the National Union of Journalists Black Members Council to deliver this year's Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture on the participation and representation of people of colour in the British media. Fatima. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mark, for your very kind introduction. And I want to start by thanking the NUJ for their continued commitment to highlighting issues of race and representation in the media by holding this annual Claudia Jones Lecture. And a thank you to Channel 4 for hosting us this evening. Now, imagine my surprise when I heard that this lecture was sold out. Uh, it turns out there was actually no better publicity for a lecture on the long, hard road towards ad adequate representation for people of colour in the media than a good old-fashioned race row caused by a bad old-fashioned dinosaur. <laughs> now we've got that one out of the way, let's talk about some serious journalism, starting with a woman who left a serious legacy. Now, although Claudia Jones spent her life looking outwards at the injustices she perceived around her, her first instinct was to challenge the structural forces of racism and sexism that overrode the goodwill of well-intentioned individuals in her own party. And it is in that spirit that we as journalists will turn our focus tonight to the deep-rooted prejudices that shape what we produce and who produces it. And that brings me to a couple of prescient insights from Claudia Jones's writings that are still so resonant today. Uh, first of all, she saw intersectionality before it had a name. She wrote while still in America in 1949. Negro women as workers, as Negroes, and as women are the most oppressed stratum of the whole population. The super exploitation of the Negro woman worker is thus revealed not only in that she receives, as woman, less than equal pay for equal work with men, but that in, the, in, but that, but in that the majority of Negro women get less than half the pay of white women. Now we've come some way since then, and for a start we don't use the word Negro anymore, and it would be unlawful to pay a journalist of colour less than a white colleague in the UK on account of their race or indeed their gender. But of course we all know that's not how racism works in Britain in 2016. It's far more sophisticated than that. It's a qualified, talented young black woman putting in 15 applications to a major broadcaster with no response. It's a Muslim journalist being made to feel by her colleagues like she's been given her job as an act of charity. And it's a daughter of working class immigrants finding herself unable to ask for a pay rise that she truly deserves because she's not imbued with the cultural confidence to do so. Jones was also prescient in analyzing how those who dominate cultural creation influence the ways people of color see themselves and the problems of their own communities. And for journalists from a minority background, that <coughs> might mean having to tell the 143rd version of the behind the veil story, based on fetishizing a Muslim woman's ability to do everyday things. Shock horror, women in a headscarf plays sport. <laughs> or it could mean a black writer being told, we have people who can write about Russia and Ukraine. Your best work is on ethnic communities. It would be unfair to those who have struggled hard to break through the barriers if we denied the progress that had been made in the last few decades. Gone are the days when we crowded around our TV sets, wide-eyed, calling our families on the landline to alert them that Moira Stewart or Trevor MacDonald was presenting the news. <laughs> Gone are the days when newsrooms were exclusively right. Now it's only 94%. <laughs> And by the way, that's a figure from research conducted by City University only this March, which I think Mark referenced earlier. That's 2016, not 1986, not 1996, not 2006, 2016. And for those who want to take a look at those um, detailed findings, they're in a study published by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Now, that same study found that apart from Jews and Buddhists who are proportionally overrepresented, people of faith generally are grossly underrepresented among UK journalists. So the numbers of Hindu and Christian journalists don't reflect the significance of those faith communities in Britain today and in British society. But by far, the worst represented group are Muslims. 
Almost 5% of the British population is Muslim, and yet only 0.4% of UK journalists are Muslim. Why does that matter? The case has been made many times for our media to reflect the population it serves, but there's something even more important at stake. Just think about the numbers of stories involving Muslims and the thorny issues and the unfamiliar ideas they throw up, ranging from politics to theology to culture and history. And then you realise that it's actually not about <coughs> special favours. It's about understanding the story and getting the facts right. Newsrooms need credible journalists from Muslim backgrounds who are familiar with the complexities of their faith, who understand the nuances of a theological debate, <coughs> and journalists who are in touch both with the intellectual tradition but also with grassroots communities. At a time when Black Lives Matter movements are finding their voice, the same needs exist for newsrooms having credible black journalists. Except those journalists should already be in the room. In fact, they should be in senior positions because in the 1980s and then the 90s, at least some journalists who are, bra who are black were recruited to help tell the stories of race riots and then later gang violence. So why is it that in 1999, Gary Young at The Guardian wrote, most of, the most of the black people you see in the newspaper cafeterias are serving the food? Why is it that the City University study, and remember, that's from March this year, suggests only 0.2% of British journalists are black? What happened to that earlier generation of black journalists? And what have young black and Muslim journalists now being recruited got to learn from that experience? What we do know is that there is a chasm between, there's a chasm in monitoring and action between print and broadcast media outlets. In 2002, Joy Francis, who set up Creative Collective, an organization to support young minority students entering journalism, claimed newspapers are not a nurturing environment because there's a perception that broadcasting has a commitment to accountability that newspapers don't have. Now, she argued that because newspapers are privately owned companies, in contrast to broadcasters who do have a public service remit, that they did not feel obliged to publish statistics about how many black and Asian journalists they employ. And the broadcasters are leading the way. In Project Diamond, an industry-wide monitoring system, the BBC, ITV, Sky and Channel 4 are examining both who's on TV and who makes TV, on-screen and behind-the-scenes representation in terms of ethnicity, gender, age, sexuality and disability. And they say it's not just about gathering statistics but about generating cultural change. And perhaps it is that latter question, who makes TV, that needs most attention in order to give minority viewers <coughs> more confidence in commissioning processes that they often see as opaque or unrepresentative. Now, there are clear lessons for the print media to learn from broadcast, firstly on monitoring per se, and then on how that monitoring is conducted, so that it includes details not just on who is reporting and who is behind the scenes, but also gives a granular picture on who does what behind the scenes. And better data would mean that the cafe staff that Gary Young mentioned earlier cannot be passed off as senior editors in the statistics. As for online-only media, the anecdotal evidence that I've heard suggests a slightly more open culture, perhaps because these outlets recognise they need to serve minority markets in order to drive traffic. But statistically, the online journalism world is something of a black hole. And there, too, we need good data on who is reporting stories and who makes decisions. Of course, in broadcast, there's a lot more to be done. The broadcasting regulator, Ofcom, conducted research earlier this year and found that 55% of black and minority groups felt they were underrepresented in public service programming. Ofcom's chief executive, Sharon White, has expressed particular concern about the BBC not serving minority communities as well as it should be. She says there is a gap and she would like to see it closed over time. And the industry is awaiting with interest an, an announcement from Ofcom tomorrow. But let's think for a moment about where the progress in broadcast media began. And our presence here tonight in this building isn't a coincidence. Some of you might remember the days when that avant-garde upstart known as Channel 4 
needed to lead a TV revolution by commissioning daring programs specifically aimed at addressing problems within minority communities led by credible minority voices, whether they were sketch writers, polemicists, budding actors or journalists. Among those programmes were the sitcom No Problem, the challenging discussion show Devil's Advocate and, of course, Desmond's. But the former commissioner responsible for propelling these changes, Farouk Dondi, now believes that the industry has leapt backwards since then. He told The Voice in 2014, TV today simply ignores the cultural contribution of the ethnic communities. So what if a black person gets to do the tango on Strictly Come Dancing? What does that explore about race and culture? Don't be fooled. The new monoculturalism in TV, he argued, forces an unnatural colour blindness on viewers where it does not exist, <coughs> effectively suppressing cultural difference or reducing it to caricature when it is acknowledged at all. BBC One's Citizen Khan, for example, takes us back several decades, Dondi argues, and I know that his view is supported by uh, a few uh, of the senior people of colour in the British media. Dundee claims that Citizen Khan is comfort food for white audiences who bask in its outdated cliches. And, and while that might be true, perhaps Citizen Khan also represents another landmark in a journey of regression. It reflects back to its Muslim and South Asian heritage audiences that same outmoded and cliche-ridden vision of contemporary Muslim life in Britain. Unlike its heroic predecessor, Goodness Gracious Me, which invited all elements of its audience to confront their own prejudices through the comic art of, sub through the comic art of subversion, Citizen Khan's protagonists would not look out of place in mind your language. So how has this happened? Is there a structural cause beyond individual commissioning decisions that is changing who decides what problems fa people of colour face and how we talk about them? The former chair of the NUJ's Black Members Council, Alex Pascal, had a, de a de decisive answer, and I'd be interested to hear from Mark if he thinks things have changed. In 2002, Alex Pascal told The Observer, as British institutions become increasingly aware of overcoming institutional racism, the media's colour blindness looks less like inclusiveness and more like willful ignorance. This points to a trend that is broader than the media but it has influenced media organisations. And it and Farouk Dondi's comments that I quoted earlier suggest there are two elements that have transformed the way race and representation are perceived in our industry. First of all, that colour-blind logic that Dondi and Pascal identify is buttressed by arguments that beneath the colour of our skin, we are, all we are all inheritors of the same culture, whether that's characterised as national, Western or global. Both Dondi and Pascal are suggesting that the other cultures that people of colour may have inherited from their families are being marginalised, and particularly that the value in them is being raised. The second transformative element is that lexicon of diversity. And when we talk about representation of people of colour, it would be remiss to leave that discussion skin deep. Targets and quotas are one way of addressing the problem of underrepresentation. But diversity and difference are not the same thing. In fact, among some young journalists of colour that I speak to, diversity has become a watchword for all the wrong reasons. And they believe that the diversity industry, if it is driven by that premise, that premise of mon monoculturalism that Don D and Pascal detected, could actually exacerbate the problems that we're here to discuss. When Idris Elba addressed Parliament earlier this year, he identified why that could happen in the future. He said, diversity in the modern world is more than just skin colour. It's gender, age, disability, sexual orientation, social background, and most important of all, as far as I'm concerned, diversity of thought. The sceptical young journalists that I mentioned see diversity as the language of offering a darker-hued version of the same thing. They're interested, they're interested in difference and not diversity, and especially in hearing and projecting differences of thought, both in their own work and their colleagues' work. They say that the, the diversity lexicon serves as an alternative to a more accurate terminology, that of racism and prejudice. 
And those are words that don't come easily when the script has already been written of a post-racial society. The awkward and uncomfortable reception they describe to me on the rare occasions they feel able to discuss such issues with colleagues may explain why it's so much easier to talk freely about sexism in the media than it is racism. The City University research I cited also found that a disproportionate number of women journalists were being paid less than £2,400 a month. And women reported that they felt less free to select and frame stories according to their own judgment than their male counterparts. And those are predic predicaments particularly understood by journalists of colour, irrespective of gender. <coughs> but again, it was Claudia Jones who warned in the 1940s about the prospects of debates on gender equality being instrumentalised by some to obscure the existence of racial prejudice. The warning was a far-sighted one that also hinted at liberal enablers of prejudice being just as solid a barrier to progress as those who express their prejudices in plain sight. Mm. Now tonight, it would be easy for me to name and shame the obvious culprits where racial prejudice is concerned in the British media. I could preach to the choir. You'd all applaud and tut uh, in disapproval on cue at the right moments, and then we'd all go home, and nothing would be any different. But the lessons from Claudia Jones's struggle against the Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1962, also known as the Colour Bar Bill, offer a more unfamiliar focus. During that campaign, Jones was asking a question that is particularly pertinent for us today. Who is a migrant, and why are they characterised as such? Among the hundreds of stories in papers and broadcast transmissions across the nation every day about migration and migrants, and think particularly about broad uh, broadsheets and highbrow news or political programmes, how many are accompanied by a picture of a white man from Poland rather than black or Asian people whose parents and grandparents may have been born here? When do we get to stop being immigrants? Why is it that even in the broadsheets and esteemed political analysis programmes, Muslim women are so often represented by the symbol of the niqab when it is so so when it is worn by so few of us? Why is it that stories about young black male victims of crime are so often linked to gang violence, even when it's totally irrelevant? The theme of these problems, which occur just as insidiously in the content of our most respected news outlets, is the characterization of people of colour as irredeemably alien. And it is from this wellspring of highbrow prejudice that the streams of hatred we are more familiar with <coughs> flow into the popular media unabated. So I wonder, with all her prescience, what Claudia Jones would make of some of the stories I hear from journalists of colour making their way in, the, making their way in those most respectable newsrooms in the country right now. Like the black female journalist who, when she's out interviewing people, has grown used to her subjects turning to her junior white colleague, who they assume will be conducting the interview or another black female journalist who was greeted for the first time by a white editor, oh, I thought you were the other one, in reference to a black colleague, because obviously we all look the same. Or a black reporter who, after dedicating time to pitching a story on general mental health issues, was told, we're not doing any more stories on black mental health, we just did one, because obviously it's unthinkable for us to get stories outside of our own communities or a Muslim woman journalist who was told when entering a corporate building, sorry, we're only letting in journalists at the moment, because obviously a woman who looks like me could never be a hardened hack. But let's never forget where that rare spring of liberal prejudice leads. One fellow black female journalist told me her most, trouble, her most troubling experience was when a viewer wrote in to complain about why an ape was reporting the news. And my hope is that these will not be seen merely as traumas that we commiserate each other on, but symptoms of a problem to which we find answers. And I've been humbled by the opportunity to pose that question. Thank you.